away. Um, I don't know if you know them. Um, oh, actually, I guess it's just one. His name is William Black. Um, he's a longtime member. And according to his daughter, he was the seventh great grandson of William Weatherall. Mm -hmm. So, um, sorry to hear his passing. Um, I would like you to know that we made about $500 on our flea market yesterday. It was very nice, a beautiful day. And we met so, so many nice people who came to the, um, uh, uh, to the table to talk to us. And I see Mr. and Mrs. Weatherall here. Is that my correct? Chuck and his wife right here. These two people have done such an outstanding job on our first burial ground, and you may have read about it in the um, in the bulletin. Uh, along with John Silva, they spent their time and their own money fixing the stones, taking out brush, clearing up poison ivy, cutting down trees, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing that they've done for the town and for those poor people who are buried there who've been forgotten for so many years. So they really thank you and I'm so glad you um, Our repairs go on. <laughs> Seems like every other day we have a new repair. Uh, we have fixed all the leaking plumbing in the building. We fixed the, um, the faucet on the front of the building. We put in two new toilets, a new sink and all the new fixtures because everything was dripping and leaking everywhere. So that is now taken care of. Um, we have written two grants. One of them we've received, so I will mention that one. The other one we're hoping we will receive. Christine wrote a grant at $7,000, and it's going to go, it, it was COVID money that the state received, and we were able to apply and it's going to cover some of our speakers, some of our utilities. It will help us get started on the museum in the carriage shed. So we're very excited about that. And we thank her a lot for sticking with that and getting it done for us. Um, and then there's just one more little bit of business that I have to bring up. Um, how many people here are already Historical Society members? Would you raise your hand up? Okay. Well, the issue that I have to bring up today is our dues schedule. As you know, um, our dues have not changed for about 30 years. It's been the same. Um, and an individual membership is $5. It does not even cover the cost of mailing out our newsletter. So we have to go up on our dues, and that will happen next month. Um, and the new, the new due schedule for individual member will be $25, a family member $30, a supporting member $50, an individual life membership $300, and a student category for $15. Now, this is the money that we depend on to pay the heat, to pay for the water, to pay for the electricity, any of the materials that we need to carry on our programs and preserve our artifacts. So I know it seems like a big jump, but when you consider we haven't raised our dues in 30 years, it's not really that bad. Um, so I hope, um, I hope that that will meet with everybody's approval. Today, we are very lucky to have a really, really interesting program. Um, and of course, you all know it's about Bay Road. And Bay Road is a pretty significant road through our town. And it goes through a lot of other towns as well. So um, without further delay, I think we'll have Mr. Blansford uh, come up and start our program. And after the program, there'll be time for lots of questions um, and any other questions that you might have or any other comments you might want to make uh, about. I will just tell you this little thing. 
we weren't sure Mr. Blanchard hadn't shown up. And so I said, oh my goodness, what happens if he forgot and he doesn't come? Who's going to speak? And our little smarty over there, Brian, said, well, you're the president. <laughs> <laughs> so I am very grateful that you came, <laughs> Mr. Blansford. So thanks, Jen. Okay. I'll come around here. So thanks for the uh, for the kind remarks and thanks for inviting me to the historical society. Uh, and uh, is Denise Brody here? So I just want to give Denise a shout out because she was very helpful to me in putting together some of this material. She was my my resource person for all things Norton, uh, in addition to some others that I'll, I'll recognize as we go along. Um, so as a quid pro quo, I said I'll be happy to you know, share with you my my research. And not just about Norton, but about you know, the entire expanse of Bay Road. So this is sort of like my traveling Bay Road show. Um, so uh, so it's, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, undertaking. And uh, I'm also humbled by the fact that there's so many of you here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon where the weather is you know, unusually pleasant. Um, so, uh, so that's a testament to your, uh, your interest in history. Mr. Blanchard, would yes. you like the lights out or on? I, I'm, I'm can good with everybody it. see okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And I trust you can hear me adequately. Yeah, sure. Okay. Great. So, um, so this was sort of uh, like my my COVID project as well, because you know, over the course of the year, um, as I was kind of cooped up, I I wanted to peel the onion back a little bit about Bay Road, not just the history of Bay Road, but Bay Road's role in history. So, uh, so that's what we're going to talk about um, over the course of the next, you know. Hour or so. So uh, a little bit of background about myself is um, I'm an amateur historian. I, I profess to have no credentials to be a real historian, so I'm sort of like an armchair historian. Um, my only uh, credibility is that um, I've lived on Bay Road since 1982. My wife and I bought a, uh, a piece of property, built a house there, and have been been there and enjoying our, our little acre um, since then. So uh, so 40 year resident, so to speak. Uh, I am a proud member of the Sharon and Stilton Historical Societies. And, you know, had I known that dues were going to go up, I might have thrown a couple of bucks towards it. Yes, ma'am. Can, can you raise it up so we can't see it? You know, put some book under it or something and make it come up higher? Yeah. Higher this one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, and, and I've always been on Bay Road, you know, as many of you have driven on Bay Road, you know, hundreds if not thousands of times over the course of, a, you know, of a life. Um, you know, I've always had this curiosity about some of the buildings, the mob markers, the cemeteries, and, you know, what the heck, what's, this, what's the story about Bay Road? So, uh, so I went to my historical society and I said, you know, can somebody do a presentation on Bay Road? And so, the, so uh, Shirley, who's our... You know, past president and archivist and all things Sharon historical. She said, "Yeah, that'd be a great idea. You can do it." <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so uh, if you don't like this presentation, it's Shirley's fault. Mm -hmm. If you enjoy the presentation, then Shirley gets the credit. So anyway, I consider myself an accidental historian. So, uh, so let's let's get into it. Uh, so Bay Road has a bunch of pseudonyms, um, as you might expect. It was called all of these half a dozen things, if not more. Um, and uh, history and legend suggest that Bay Road connects the Massachusetts Bay in Boston to you know, one of the bays in the south, whether it's southeast, due south, or southwest. So um, that's really the origin of, of the, you know, why it was called Bay Road. And there's differing opinions um, as to which bay it connects to. Um, but it does traverse through all of our towns. Um, and it actually was called these roads before the, some of those name changes occurred. So literally from the Massachusetts Bay to all of the bays down below, um, it was called you know, the Old Bay Road. So pop quiz, just to make sure you're all paying attention. Massachusetts Bay in Boston, down Bay Road connects to which of the three Choices would you suggest? Is it Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island? Is it Cape Cod Bay in Plymouth? Or is it Buzzards Bay in the Bedford? Number one. Number one. Number one. Okay. So we have a lot of takers for, for Narragansett Bay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see where the research takes us. So um, 
the, as I said, early records will, will uh, tell us that, uh, that it was the original hunting of the, the Bay Road, the, the, the Bay Road started from the Wampanoags going from their summer hunting headquarters in the water to their winter headquarters inland. So they were the first ones to create this path. Now, if you talk to the Wampanoags, which I have, they say they took, they, they were called people of first light. That's the Indian ter term, or the Native American term for Wampanoags, the people of first light. Now, they um, said that they'd been on this land since the glaciers receded from the Ice Age. So that's going to be 10 to 15,000 years ago. So they're the original people of this land. So they got the, they got the credit of, of, of making the first path that we now call Beirut. Um, so based on that, you know, we could say that Beirut, you know, with some hubris, uh, is that Beirut could be among the oldest roads in North America. If it goes back as a path from how the, the Native Americans were traversing it from their from their summer to winter hunting headquarters. So as a path, it was reported by them to be a foot deeper, as well as by the first colonists, is that it was a foot deeper in the middle than it was on the sides because of the because of all the how the people were trotting along. Now, um, now when the Mayflower came in 1620 and established Plymouth Colony, um, the Mayflower left in April of 1621. And like, okay, now you know we're on our own, everybody. Mayflower is gone now. Um, Captain Miles Standish, who was in charge of the defense of the Plymouth Colony, tasks Edward Winslow and Stephen Hopkins to find Massasoit and to have a peace, a peace treaty with him. Now they've already had the Thanksgiving and there's a lot of, you know, sort of myth and legend about the Thanksgiving and how much, what it really consisted of. But you know, they had a, they had a peaceful interaction. Now, uh, because the Mayflower left, uh, Miles Standish wants to have an ongoing treaty with, with the, many of the braves that are out there in the hinterlands. So he tasks Winslow and Hopkins to go find Massasoit's headquarters, and that's over by Mount Hope on the other side of the Taunton River, close to Rhode Island. So these guys track from Plymouth across, um, across the Bay Road path to get to Massasoit's uh, headquarters and they and they give him a red cloak, you know, red is regal, so they give him a red cloak. You know, he'll like us a lot more if we give him a, you know, we, we sort of humble ourselves to him and, you know, they won't, they won't take us out. So it worked. Um, but this is where they first came across this path. Um, so these were the first colonists, the first English people to see the Bay Road path. Now, it, then in 1630, the Boston colony was called the Massachusetts colony, actually it was called the Shawmut colony before Boston. Before Boston was called Boston, it was called Shawmut. And in 1630, the colony was established there. Um, and that was the Massachusetts tribe. And if you went far enough along that path, you connect up with the Massachusetts colony. And you connect up with the Massachusetts tribe. And they said, whoa, we have a real nice path here to connect between the two bays. So dozens of others started leading it. Then, then Taunton became um, a settlement in 1638. Um, and Taunton became an early waypoint. It started as a settlement and became a town in 1639. And the Bay Road path from Taunton to Boston is 36 miles. And we've all tra probably traveled it many times ourselves. But now it's been usurped and surpassed by you know, Route 138 and Route 24 and lots of other paths. But, but you can still travel that path. And I have, and I'll show you. So if you look at the Bay Road route map, you know, going back over time, it starts actually in Washington Street at the Adams Street Loop. And I'll show you a picture here. I know it doesn't project well, but uh, I'll do an overlay on it like that. So now you see it. So what you see is, this was pretty cool. I got to do this again. It took me like 10 minutes to make that happen. So I'm, just, uh, I'm so proud of myself for doing that. Yeah. Uh, OK, so we have, we have um, starting up here at the Boston Common. And this is called the Adams Loop. So the Adams Loop, right here, into Dorchester Lower Mills, into Dorchester, but crossing through um, Washington Street, through Canton, uh, through Canton, and then into, this is, um, th right here, through Canton, I'm sorry, th through Milton, and then through Canton, and it sort of dissects Canton, and then we get to Cobb's Corner, right here, so this is the tri-corner of Canton, Sharon, and Stoughton, and this is um, Cobb's Corner Tavern, 
which we'll talk about. <coughs> and it's interesting because Bay Road, as it continues, forms the boundary, the town line between Sharon and Stoughton. Then it moves on into Easton, and it's it essentially just like Hampton, it dissects Easton in half. And then it moves into uh, your favorite town, into Norton, and we see it as it goes into Norton, and then it goes into Taunton. So, um, so this is the original, and we can see uh, some of the notes I've made, is that uh, uh, Easton, Easton's part of Bay Road is on the National Register. They're very proud of their road. Um, and because it dissected their town in half, there's a lot of historic markers and buildings and cemeteries. So Easton is, a, is sort of a cornucopia of, of history about Bay Road. Um, and I'm learning a lot more about Norton as well. Um, Norton, interesting, has the two nicest bodies of water along the Bay Road, uh, Lake Winnicott and, and, and Watson Pond. Then when we get to Taunton, um, we get to Taunton, there's the Taunton Green, and actually there's a waypoint um, where we have alternate extensions. So, a lot further ado. Into Taunton, and then it gets interesting. So, for those of you that said Bay Road goes to Narragansett Bay, pay attention. And those of you that think Bay Road went to Cape Cod Bay based on, you know, uh, Winslow and Hopkins, let's take a look. Uh, oh, so just to back up for a second. So, this um, map is 1939. So this map came from 1939 from the Canton Historical Society. So I want to give you know, props to the people that helped me out. So, so 1939, and then we get to this map, and this map is 1844. And this is the first map that can't read it too well, but trust me when it says up here, the heavy line is Old Bay Road, broken line are extensions. So here's our favorite Bay Road, and then we get to Taunton, and we have these three extensions. And all of those three extensions end up in Narragansett Bay down here. So for those of you that said, oh sure. For those of you that said Narragansett Bay, pat yourselves on the back, you're correct. But um, what about Bay Road to Cape Cod Bay? So here's um, another shot of Bay Road going from Here's the, door, the Adams Loop down to Dorchester, and then it makes its way down to, uh, you know, through Brentree, Weymouth, and down into the Cape. And this has lots of markers and uh, parting stones, and, uh, but, you know, there's evidence to show that Bay Road also is a pathway from Boston to, um, to, uh, to Massachusetts. I'm sorry, to, uh, to, to Plymouth Bay. Um, so uh, those of you that thought that, you're correct. Now, how about Buzzards Bay? So we see uh, this map that shows, this was very interesting to me about all of the various post roads. And so we, you know, if we want to just call out our Bay Road, so this one here, uh, the, uh, the Bay Road here, the sort of like an olive drab, <coughs> say how it goes straight down into New Bedford. Um, and this map also shows this path here. And this path here is the, uh, the old rollback or the, or the lower post road. And then we have the upper post road here. So um, we hear a lot of talk about post roads. And, and in my research, I found that there's actually three post roads, the upper, the middle, and the lower. And what's the origin of a post road? I was curious to find out. Well, it's really all about postal service. So remember, Benjamin Franklin was the original postmaster of the colonies. And so back then, if you, I just found this interesting. Back then, if you wanted to mail a letter, there was no, we didn't put any postage on it. That didn't come until 1840. So if I wanted to mail a letter to Chris, um, I would put her address on it, and then she would pay for the postage on the other end. So she has to really want to get my letter. <laughs> because if she says, not interested in this guy, forget about it, then, then you know, the, the post, the carrier is kind of left over the bag. So, so they changed all that. So, and you pay postage by um, how far the letter had to travel. And so, so the post roads were very important. So when you see a post road, you'll see markers on it. You know, it says 30 miles to Boston or 50 miles to Albany or, or things like that. So all of those were to determine how much postage Chris would have to pay to get my letter. Now, um, so Benjamin Franklin gets credit for this, but I'm not sure it's completely accurate. He gets credit for, well, he, you know, he was quite a 
clever inventor, and he created some sort of odometer on his wagon wheel where when, there, when a carriage is going out, and he'd say, okay, it's 10 miles to this spot, put a marker. It's 20 miles to this spot, put a marker. So, so then, the, then they would know how much to charge for letters. You know, it's a, it's a good story, and there's some evidence to it, but it's not definitive that the invention of Anyway, so there's evidence to show that Bay Road goes to the Buzzards Bay as well. So we're convinced that it goes Boston to Taunton, like a you know, straight shot. But then, you know, like I said, Taunton's kind of like an interchange, kind of a waypoint. And, and it does have evidence to show that it goes to all three locations. Okay, so we got our geography out of the way. Now let's turn to another topic, which was notable events and famous travelers. So who traveled our famous Bay Road? Well, going way back, uh, we all know about Massasoit. We talked about him briefly with the, you know, um, how the, uh, the colonists befriended him, and he was uh, very helpful in, uh, in uh, continuing their existence. Massasoit was the chief sachem of the Wampanoag Confederacy, which was probably about 50 or 60 assorted tribes. Massasoit had five children, um, and, uh, and a couple of them, he asked the English to give them an English name. So, um, so they named Wamsuda Alexander, and they named Metacom uh, Philip. Uh, the women didn't get uh, English names, just the way it was. Um, and so Metacom, we all know about as King Philip, and King Philip's war was important because it was uh, probably the first battle that happened in, you, know, in, you know, since we became a colony. Um, you know, there's the French and Indian Wars as well, but this was really uh, one of the first battles in that. Now, when I, when I did research with the Eastern folks, um, they took me to uh, King Philip. They're saying that King Philip was born if you come down Bay Road and you're, uh, you're coming from Sharon, heading into Easton, heading towards Norton, and you cross 106 in the Easton Five Corners, you continue on south and you hit a traffic light and there's Highland Street. You take a ride on Highland Street, there's a brook there. Uh, it's called Mulberry Brook and there's a fishing weir. Now, the Easton folks say that, that when they were doing some excavation and some construction, they always ask and sometimes they, they receive a member of the tribe to come up and look around. So they were told by oral history that, that Metacom, or King Philip, was born by that fishing weir. And a fishing weir, for those that don't know, it was how Indians, how, how Native Americans um, got fish. They didn't do it with a fishing rod. They would create sort of like a cylindrical oval um, type of spiral so the fish would, would, would swim with the current and they would get trapped in this sort of spirally uh, cage. And so they, would, couldn't, they couldn't swim backwards, so they would just, they would go to the fishing weir, pull out the fish, and that's how they, that's how they did, they got the fish. So it's pretty interesting. So there was a fishing weir there, and that's, you know, there was a settlement, and that's where King Philip allegedly was born. I'll leave that to you. So it's, it's on Bay and Highland in Easton, and it's actually quite interesting to look at it. Um, and then, of course, we know about King Philip's cave in Norton. I'm sure you folks have seen that. And if you haven't, here's a picture of our friend Metacom. This is down in Plymouth. And there's a picture of King Philip's cave. It's off of Plain Street. Um, and so if you were to walk up you know, from Plain Street, you take a right on Plain Street and it's a little bit on the left. Um, uh, yeah, it's a little bit on the right as you take your right. And then you walk up and this is the entrance that you would see to King Philip's cave. Uh, and then this is as you want to you know, kind of stoop down a little bit and walk through King Philip's cave. And then this is on the other side where there's an opening. So if you use your imagination, you know, allegedly, legend and history say King Philip had a hideout here. Um, you know, just, uh, sort of as, as the, the King Philip's War was starting to take effect and, uh, and, the, and the, the Native Americans were starting to lose by attrition, um, he allegedly hid out here. So he would come up here and, it, and, uh, and they would have an opportunity to hide and stay away from the elements in here. And then they, this would be like sort of like their great room. You know, this is where the kitchen was. This is where the gathered, you know, they would have their food. And, and, uh, and they would also have an egress if anybody's coming up to them from the front. So that's the story about King Philip's Cave, and that's right here in town. Okay, other famous travelers. We're going to go in chronological order. So Roger Williams. You know, I think we all know Roger Williams is given credit for founding Providence. So what happened to Roger Williams? So um, he was an early proponent for the separation of church and state, and he believed in free thinking, free speech, free religion. He was a, a devotee of Sir Edward Cook, 
he came up with the expression, a man's home is his castle. And I can say anything I want in my own home because it's my, it's my home. You know, I, I own it, I work it, um, I pay taxes on it. Um, so I could say, you know, the heck with this one or the heck with that one or whatever because it's my place. Well, that was an anathema to the Puritans. Puritans, everything was, was uni, unifocal about, you know, the you know, religion and government and church and everything all were unified and in one, one man. Um, also, uh, Roger Williams was opposed to taking land. You could just, you know, go into the woods and plant your flag and say, I declare this land for King George. And, and King George said, you can do that. And, you know, you can take the land. Roger Williams said, that's not right. So I'll purchase it from the Indians. And, you know, and it was kind of also kind of, kind of cheesy because, you know, you give them a few blankets and, you know, you get 40 acres of land, which like, just wasn't, wasn't right either. But, um, so he, he actually made an effort to purchase land from the Native Indians as opposed to taking land. Well, anyway, he had a falling out with the people from uh, the Puritan belief, and, uh, and they said, you are found guilty of new and dangerous opinions and you're practicing Satan's policy. You know, we're going to throw you in jail. So before he got thrown in jail, he exiled himself and he went south. So he left Boston and he went down Bay Road and sought refuge with the Narragansett Indians. And he did try to convert to Christianity. He tried to create an experiment. Um, he bought land from them in Rhode Island and he named it Providence in thanksgiving to God. And he started this social experiment to be open to everybody with religious and political freedom to think and do and practice as you see fit. Can you imagine he even had Quakers and Jews you know, in his colony? You know, this was crazy at the time. But, uh, but it was, you know, it, that was what, what uh, made him uh, unique. And, and his, Anne Hutchinson, uh, she did the same thing a few years later and, and came down Bay Road and established the colony of, in Portsmouth. So Rhode Island was this big social experiment between Portsmouth and Providence uh, because of, uh, you know, because they were trying to get away from the, the, you know, the rigidity and the inflexibility of the Puritan. Okay, so how about George Washington? So, did George Washington travel up and down the road? Well, let's think about this. Well, I remember April 19th, 1775, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world, you know, the bridge, you know, the North Bridge and Concord and all of that. And then a couple months later, the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, all of this was going on, uh, and it really was the starting, the start of the American Revolution. George Washington, um, he was in Philadelphia at the time where they were having the Constitutional Conventions. And the Constitutional Convention said, George, we want you to lead an army and get ready to fight back against, you know, because we're getting our asses beaten by, uh, you know, by, the, by the British, so we need you to raise an army. So Washington travels to Boston, 400 miles, to take command of the newly formed army, and in fact, June 14th is the birthday of the United States Army. June 14th, 1775, was when, the, uh, uh, the, when George got his taskings. Um, he left on June 23rd, took him nine days, went through 50 towns. People turned out, it's well documented. George Washington slept here. You know, all of this stuff, you know, is well documented that, uh, that George made this trap, this, this trek. You know, he traveled all the way up there. So did he travel up Bay Road? Did he go from Taunton? You know, through Norton, through you know, Easton, through Sharon, you know, into Dorchester. Well, did he or not? I don't think so. Sorry to burst people's beliefs, but Eastern people were convinced that he did. But you know, because they have they have some you know stories of you know that people that he, he that that he he raised militia as he was going through Easton and all that, but not so because there's better evidence that he took one of the upper post roads. Because if you're going to go to Cambridge, why do you want to come up and have to cross the river to get over to Cambridge? So he came up through Hartford, and he came across Massachusetts you know, from the west and came into Cambridge from the west, not from the south. And there's plenty of evidence to show. And you know what the evidence is? Every tavern he stayed in, there's bills for the rum. <laughs> uh, and not just for George, but you know, for you know, he didn't travel by himself. So, so there's much better evidence that George Washington traveled um, from the west, not from the south. So even though we'd like to say George Washington traveled on our Bay Road, I have to say probably not. 
Ben Franklin. So Ben Franklin did, did travel up on that Bay Road. So here's his story. We all know him as the first postmaster. Now in November of 1775, um, again, he was in Philadelphia. Uh, he had to travel, I'm sorry, he was in Boston. He had to travel from Boston to Philadelphia for the second Continental Congress. So um, he traveled down Bay Road, right outside our, you know, he traveled from Boston into Taunton. It's well documented, and it's well documented because he visited at the home of Robert Treat Payne. Now, Robert Treat Payne has an interesting history. Um, he was the son of Thomas Payne. Thomas Payne wrote all the pamphlets called Common Sense. Uh, you know, and he was the one that sort of was the instigator to, you know, these are the times of tribe insoles and, and all that good stuff. So that was his son. His other claim to fame is that the Armistead, when, um, when the Boston Massacre occurred and the Redcoats you know, murdered, you know, killed a lot of the Boston locals um, at, the, at the Boston Massacre, um, they were put on trial. And John Adams took the Redcoats' defense. Robert Treat Payne was the prosecutor. Now, Robert Treat Payne said, this is a slam dunk case. They didn't even hardly prepare. He said, you know, we're going we're gonna to strike up these you know, these English people. You know, so the people will be the worst. So John Adams, you know, future second president, was a very smart lawyer, and he prepared his case, and he got them acquitted. So kind of like, you know, how, how do you take such an easy case and blow it? So that's Robert Tree. <laughs> um, and, and it's documented because, <coughs> because Ben Franklin stopped and stayed at their home, and, and Sally writes in her diary, Yes, Dr. Franklin, thank you so much for visiting me. Please take this letter to my husband and let him know I'm running this farm, I'm working my butt off, I'm taking care of the kids, I'm taking care of the livestock, I'm doing the crops. You know, if you could check in every so often, it would be so helpful and so grateful, as opposed to living the life of a, you know, a, a, a founding father and, and, uh, and you know, being white at night. So, uh, so, so uh, he says, yes, of course, Mrs. Payne, I will deliver the letter and your, and your concerns directly to, you know, Mr. Payne. Uh, so, uh, so that's well documented that he, that he did that. And in fact, this is at the, this painting um, is the Taunton Green. It's in the old Colony Museum, you know, right there in Taunton. And this is um, Robert Tree Payne's house, Sally and, uh, and Dr. Frank and my visit. So we feel pretty comfortable about that. So, so uh, old Ben did travel on our road. Okay, another famous uh, luminary that traveled on their road. This is an interesting story because um, Marquis de Lafayette was like a 17-year-old general. You know, I was in the army, and like, you know, 17, you could even make E1 private, but you know, this guy's like a general. Uh, so uh, he was, George Washington was very fond of him. They fought at the Battle of Monmouth in New Jersey together. So Washington dispatches Lafayette to Rhode Island uh, in an effort to expel the British. So the, so the British were, were circling around Rhode Island, and they were ready to attack, and um, the French now had helped us, so French Free Admiral Comte de Stang was supposed to be there to protect the Rhode Island colony. Uh, Lafayette gets there, there's no French Admiral, there's no French fleet. The, the local colonists are really anxious, they're very nervous, they feel like they're in jeopardy. Um, so Lafayette says, okay, I'm on it. So he, on August 28th, he gets a horse, he races to Boston from Portsmouth, Rhode Island. How do you get from Portsmouth, Rhode Island to Boston? His mission was to find the Admiral and say, you got to come back to, you know, to Rhode Island and protect the colonists. They're really unhappy and they're, and they're feeling nervous. And he says, relax, relax. I'm just getting some provisions and getting some work done on my ships. I'll be back. Tell them to come back. He says, okay, thanks so much. There's an about face, gallops all the way down. So it's 70 miles. Oops. It's 70 miles from Boston, uh, it's 70 miles from Boston to, you know, from Portsmouth to Boston. He does it in six hours. He returns in five and a half hours. That's really moving. He has to change horses at the taverns. And so there's where it's proven that he actually stopped there, got fresh horses, you know, had a, something to, had a little bit of water, you know, went to use the outhouse and off again. So, uh, so that's pretty well documented. So we have Lafayette, you know, who's traveled up and down our Bay Road. So good for him and good for us. And then now Paul Revere and Deborah Sampson. Now, we all know Paul Revere. 
for those of you that may or may not know Deborah Sampson, she's a famous daughter of Sharon. Um, and uh, Paul Rear, in addition to all of his accomplishments you know, as a patriot, um, in the later years of his life, uh, after the revolution, um, he established copper rolling mills on the, on the Ponset River in 1801. Uh, and, and if you have the occasion to go through the center of Canton and you know, take that into Ponset Street to you know, get on and off 95, um, in fact, Washington Street in Canton was the Old Bay Road. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's, a water, there's water power there. So he would have a copper rolling mill using the water power of the Ponset River. Deborah Sampson, um, now she's the one that, uh, that wanted to serve her country, so she dressed as a man to fight for the Revolutionary Army. Um, and she was successful in fighting for the Revolutionary Army. And she was successful in, 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 in uh, disguising her gender to be a, and she was a successful soldier. It was only when she was wounded that her gender was discovered and she was discharged. She was not dishonorably discharged, she was just discharged. So she was eligible for back pay, and she was eligible for a pension. Um, after, uh, and then she lived on Bay Road, uh, and I'll show you that, it's the Zebulon Waters House, which I'll show you coming up. So she lived on Bay Road um, uh, with her uh, aunt um, uh, at the Zebulon Waters House, her aunt Mary Zebulon Waters on Bay Road, um, and that's where she met her future husband, Benjamin Gannett Jr. So Deborah Sampson um, appealed to Paul Revere and said, you know, can you help me get my back pay and can you help me get my pension? You know, that's a lot of money. It was like four dollars a month. Uh, you know, and I, everybody else would get a pension. Why can't I get a pension? And so, so he goes to the Continental Congress. Um, Paul Rivera advocated on her behalf. Um, and they reportedly met several times at Cobb's Tavern um, at, the, at that Triton intersection where he delivered her back pay and pension. And they had a cup of good cheer, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, so those are my famous um, events and travelers. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the locations. And we'll kind of talk about them in this order. So, uh, tavern schools and churches, buildings, you know, mile markers, some of the cemeteries, and some of the bodies of water. So we're going to start from the north and work our way towards the south. Okay, so starting in the north in Camden, on the corner of Pleasant Street in Camden. Um, Samuel May opened the shop in 1740. Um, his brother, Nathaniel May, hosted a lot of meetings there. And this was a, this was a respite for, for the militia that were being mustered and traveling north up to the, the Lexington Alarm. So when they were moving their, their way north through, uh, you know, through Bay Road, they needed a place to rally and a place to rest. And so, so May's Tavern was famous for that. Uh, and, uh, and in later years, the Stoughton Musical Society had many performances there. There were Tory trials after the war. So if you were a Tory was a was a, a British sympathizer. So if you uh, if, you know you weren't for the cause of independence, but you were still loyal to the British crown, um, and you were found to be aiding and abetting uh, the enemy, uh, Tory trials were held at the Mays Tavern. So it has a lot of a lot of interesting history. It's right there on the corner of Pleasant and Washington. Unfortunately, that original building is gone, uh, but this building, which is not Still pretty old, an 1840 building is the one that's still there today. But I just thought I'd share that site with you. Moving further south, um, at the intersection of, of uh, Cobb's Tavern. Um, before I show you a picture of it, we'll just get a few of the facts uh, out of the way. Um, so, the original owner in 1740 was Elijah Fisher. Um, and Jonathan Cobb, he purchased the property near the turn of the century. He enlarged it considerably. He had 10 children in you know, just over 20 years. Um, so he needed a bigger house. So he put together quite a big house uh, and it became a tavern. Uh, his, uh, Jonathan Cobb, he, he was appointed postmaster uh, and, and, uh, and he was on, it was on the stage line from Boston to Taunton. And it's kind of a halfway mark. You know, so, so I think it was also you know, the intersection of, a, you know, of other towns. So it became a logical um, gathering spot. One of his sons, um, Warren Cobb, took over as postmaster in 1841. And, and that intersection is the easternmost part of Sharon. So it became East Sharon. I don't know how long, how long it was called East Sharon. It's not called East Sharon anymore, unless you're you know, uh, really uh, um, sort of antiquated. But uh, uh, that's uh, where it is now. And then Warren Cobb closed the post office 
gave the home to his two daughters. He remained in the Cobb family until 1935. Um, and then uh, Ebenezer Jones took it over. He had it for a number of years. Um, and now it's in, he sold it. It's in private hands. It's not open to the public anymore. Um, I remember when my, uh, my daughters, who were in their 30s now, but when they were school children, there would be school trips to, uh, to the Cobb's Tavern, uh, specifically to see the tap room which was 15 feet long, an unpainted bar, and a money slot at the end, which I'll show you next. So this is a picture of the Cobb's Tavern, probably in its heyday. It's just like circa 1890. Um, and uh, you know, the, it's sort of an unimproved road. But here you are in, uh, in the intersection down here, and you're heading south down Bay Road. You're heading towards Norton. This is the, this is the, the tavern. Um, and so, you know, it looks kind of kind of a mishmash here, but the, this is the famous bar, and they would have a slot on the end, uh, you know, and a couple of chairs, and you know, you'd, you'd have your, uh, your, 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 uh, you would imbibe with your victuals. This is Cobb's Tavern today. Um, so it's it's still in pretty good shape. Um, they, uh, they're they in the process of painting it, but they haven't finished. I don't know why, they either ran out of paint, they ran out of money, <laughs> they ran out of energy, they ran out of something, but it's still not finished. Uh, but it's still it's still in reasonably good shape today, and I'm told um, that uh, that they you know they they're doing some conversions inside because they have a special needs child and they had to do some uh, some changes to the inside of the building to accommodate a special needs child. But we don't know. Um, hopefully the tavern is still intact, but we don't know that. Okay, moving down. I'm going to move more a little more quickly here. So moving down uh, Bay Road. On, on the Stoughton side, again, so we're moving, we're moving from the north to the south, and on the left-hand side is uh, the William Drake House. It's hard to see because it's got a lot of foliage, but there is a little marker here um, that says, uh, you know, 1775. So that's really, you know, at the high water mark of the beginning of the, of the independence. Um, this is on the corner of Bay Road and Plain Street. Uh, this is a cemetery over here, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but this is the James Smith House, 1794, so the sign says it right there. Um, and this house looks like nothing from the street, but it expands quite a bit going back, I'm sure, with many, many additions going forward. Um, here's the Archibald's Drake House, 1738. That's pretty old. This is on the Sharon side, uh, almost across the street from that cemetery. Uh, this was just recently sold, um, and, uh, and it, again, it doesn't look like much from the front. Uh, but, the, uh, uh, but it's got a big addition on the side and a big addition in the back. And it actually has a nice view of dry pond, which is really not dry at all, but uh, you know, it's got a nice, nice water view. Yeah. And here's the Zebulon Water House that I mentioned earlier. This is 1730. Again, it had uh, just been renovated, I don't know, maybe about five or six years ago. Uh, new owners, uh, they've, done a, they've done a very nice job. Um, and uh, they kept it up, so uh, you know, good, good looking house, you know, uh, and they had a nice attached, uh, detached barn. Um, and this is where um, Deborah Sampson met her husband, and where she, uh, you know, sort of recovered from her um, uh, honorable discharge. Okay, um, it's going back to the other side of the street now. Um, this is the Hezekiah Gay House, 1767. This is also called the Popcorn House uh, because they would grow corn. This doesn't look much like it did then because they didn't have these big you know, bow windows. Uh, I don't think they had these kind of porches. But if you can just look at the original structure, you know, aside from the, the siding and all of that, but uh, the foundation, the bones of that house are still pretty old. Um, and they would they would plant corn and they would pop corn um, and they did it regularly such that the story goes that you would walk into this house during the summer when it was hot and humid and it would smell like popcorn. So it became known as the Popcorn House. Uh, this is the Ephraim Payson House, um, again, 1761. You know, if you, if you blew up the, the slide, you could, you could see, a, you know, the, there's a marker right here. Oh, here, here's the marker, 1761. Uh, and this is called the Lightning House, because in the process, look how close this is to the street, which is very common back then. Um, you know, here's here's Bay Road right here. There's a you know the white line giving you the shoulder, and then here's you know, you know just a minimum protection, and then boom, you're right in the front door. So not much, not much. Uh, they had a lot of 
space in the back, but not much in the front. It was just very common uh, to have your house close so that you could get in and out, you know, without having to deal with too much of the weather and, uh, and all that. So uh, this was called the Lightning House because during one of its renovations, and they took the walls down to the studs, they found that uh, over the fireplace there were beams that were singed. And so they investigated and found out that these, this house has been struck by lightning, not once, but twice. Um, and, uh, uh, and it didn't burn to the ground, but, uh, but it still has singed beams within its walls. So hence the lightning house. Okay, now we've crossed 106 Foundry Street. We're now crossed into Easton. And we're now, this is, uh, this is the oldest house in Easton, the Josiah Key House. It's in 1777. Um, and so this is, when I took this picture, it was still inhabited. It's, it's not inhabited at the moment. Uh, I took this last year. Um, and it's not inhabited at the moment. Um, and when I was talking to the Easton folks, to them, this is hallowed ground. You know, first house in Easton. Uh, they're trying to you know, scrape together a bunch of bottles and cans. They'd like to buy it and make it into a trust and, uh, and all that because it's, a, it's really quite a beautiful property. And it also has a, a, a brook, a brook off to the side in the back. There's a brook over here, and then they also had a very modest sawmill there. Um, and this, they also tell me that this was actually two stories. But over the, over the years, um, it's an unusual design now, but they, uh, in order to save the house, they eliminated the second story and just brought the roof down onto the first story. Um, and, uh, and they, you know, so it has an unusual design to it, so it's, a, it's kind of a one-off type of a house. Uh, but the, well, as we'll see in a few moments, the Keith family, um, you know, perhaps just like the Lincoln family and other families in your, your various towns, um, it's a repeating name, you know, generations continue on. So uh, the Keith family is quite popular in the town of East. Uh, in fact, the, you know, one of Josiah Keith not the original Josiah Keith, but a son of Josiah Keith. I don't know if he's the second or the third. Um, we all recognize this gas station, you know, the Five Corners. Well, this was the site of a tavern, of course. You know, but, you know taverns are everything. They really were a lot back then. So here's the picture today, and here's a picture of the original tavern. So the cool thing about this that sort of orient you is um, this is 106. Okay, so this is 106 here, and if you're taking a left up here, you're going to go up Bay Road. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to take a, you know, here's a fork a little bit. Um, so left up the Bay Road and a fork here up to 123. And so here's the gas station. So again, Boundary Street, and if you went straight on Boundary Street over this way, you'd be, you'd be heading towards um, Bridgewater. So this side, you know, you're coming from Mansfield and Dorton. Okay, so coming from North and Mansfield on Foundry Street, 106. You have that on the left, you go up Bay Road, you go, you know, kind of angle here, you go up 123 towards, uh, towards Easton, and if you go this way, you're going to go towards Bridgewater. So, uh, so that's the original Josiah Keith Tavern um, on that property that's now uh, the mobile station. I got that from the, from the Easton folks. And so, what a great photo. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so this is the second oldest. Um, town, uh, house, second oldest house in Easton, uh, Park 39 Bay Road. And again, because, you know, Bay Road kind of dissects Easton down the middle, um, the Benjamin Williams Tavern uh, had, was, uh, what year was that? I think it was like in the 1740s. Um, I don't have it written down. Uh, but the, the interesting thing that you might, you might also recognize is that right next to it is the farmer's wife antique store. So I don't know how many folks go antiquing up and down Bay Road, but you know, this is the, uh, the farmer's wife antique store. Um, and, it's, and it's on the same property as the Benjamin Williams Tavern. Uh, this was their barn. So you know, Mrs. Williams, I don't know if it's the current Mrs. Williams or not, a farmer's wife, so she turn the barn into an antique store. And, and it still is there today. So uh, when I went, um, it was closed, unfortunately. Uh, but I was, I was kind of interested to go in there, poke around, and you know, see, see the bones of the barn and, uh, and see what it looks like compared to the building. OK, um, again, it's still moving south.
coming, you know, we're not, we're not into Norton yet, but we're moving south. And uh, here's the Wheaton Farm on 500 Bay Road in southeast. Um, and this is interesting because, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this farmland was where the Eastern militia drilled. That's what they tell me. So, that, so they were practicing their drill and ceremony, and they were practicing their, all their maneuvers, and uh, so they would take this farmland, and they would all muster on this. And then when they were ready, they moved north up the Mace Tavern, and they moved on to the fight. So this was one of their rallying points, and this is where the Eastern militia uh, practiced their, uh, their battle movements. So um, across the street from the Wheaton Farm is the Wheaton Farm House. Um, and this is, uh, uh, was owned by Daniel Wheaton, who is the brother of the guy that founded Wheaton College. So, so his brother founded Wheaton College. Um, he um, had his farmhouse. Right across the street from this farmhouse is, uh, is that barn and, and the field. Now, um, I hear lots of stories about the farmhouse that people that would stay in the farmhouse would see ghosts of Native Americans and of women. Uh, you know, and there's lots of lots of ghost stories associated with this house. Um, it, it also was for sale when I was buying when I was buying when I buying the picture. Uh, but it is uh, it is quite famous. Uh, in fact, the Eastern historical guy that was sharing his history with me, uh, he says that he's had many reports called into him of of people walking up and down Bay Road like a solitary soldier uh, on a march heading north. And they, you know, they turn around again and it's gone. And, uh, you know, kind of like it's, it's clever, it's quaint, you know, it kind of captures your imagination. Um, but, uh, but this, you know, it, you know, this place apparently has uh, not just colonial history, but it has uh, uh, extra, extra perception history. <laughs> okay, um, again, still moving further south, here's a general store at 412 Bay Road Southeast, and there's lots of houses in Eastern, so I'm only giving you a couple. Uh, but this is uh, Kimball's general store, and here's Mr. Kimball. And, and you know, so this was your, uh, I guess this, this was your target, but this was your, you know, uh, you know, your Ace Hardware. All of these barrels were filled with nails, they were filled with, you know, anything that you would need, you know, to, to keep your property going. Uh, so that was the Kimball's general store, and here it is today. You can still kind of see the outline um, over here um, of the Kimball's General Store. They sell their bar. So very nice. This building still exists. And you know, from the outside, you wouldn't necessarily think that the house is really that old. Okay, voila. Welcome to Norton. Okay. Um, so, you know, here's where I'd like you guys to add to my collection of knowledge, so tell me if I'm correct, half correct, totally ganked up, or somewhere in between. So by all means, I would you know, walk me right into it. So, uh, so this is the site, uh, there's a marker here, the site of the first house in Norton, built by William Motherwell, 1869, um, and it was erected in, you know, by the town in 1880. So this is right across the street from the Chateau, it used to be Anne's place, and like what a cut. And I know um, your president mentioned about the cemetery that's up behind that. You know, so good work for everybody for you know, for working on that. But um, I found the story of William Witherell uh, fascinating. So uh, Sergeant Witherell um, was he sort of earned his stripes um, in the Great Narragansett Great Narragansett Swamp Fight during King Philip's War. So towards the tail end of King Philip's War, when you know, the, the Native Americans fought the only way they knew. You know, they fought through the war. They couldn't sit behind trees. They'd sneak up behind you. You know, they did anything they could to sort of gain an advantage. And that was sort of like not the way uh, proper you know, English fighters are going to fight. They're going to line up and duke it up. Um, so, uh, so then a Church, a guy named Church, decided to go after them in their, in their own hunting areas, and so we went into the Great Narragansett Swamp, slaughtered lots of women and children, and really uh, kind of turned the tide by, by hitting them in their, you know, in their Achilles heel. Um, and so uh, Sergeant Wetherill uh, fought in that Narragansett Swamp, uh, 
and it's an interesting place, to, you know, it's not easy to find, but you know, there's lots of markers there, and it's a nice place for a day trip. So uh, he was wounded. He spent 10 months in, I think, South Kingston, Rhode Island, recovering from his wounds. When he came back uh, to Norton, uh, the Plymouth Colony uh, granted him a license to, to retail cider, beer, and strong liquors, and conceivably, you know, the first public drinking establishment in your time. At least, well, that's my that's my opinion. Um, I found this one interesting, and, and uh, this is on 153 Bay Road. So this is the Joseph White House. Uh, this is kind of fallen into a little bit of disrepair, I'm sorry to say, um, but it, uh, it looks like it's got great bones. It's a circa 1775, as it says it right here. Uh, and when I looked it up, with help from, you know, from your, your society, uh, so the third son of Nicholas White originally lived in Milton, um, and then he said, you know, Milton's getting a little too crowded for me. Um, I need to move out into the country a little bit more. So he decided to go south, travels down Bay Road, uh, and then decides to build this house. Uh, and, uh, and his third son, Nicholas White, built this house, I'm sorry. Third son, Nicholas White, after, after uh, uh, Joseph White, you know, sort of emigrates out of Milton. Uh, and uh, Joseph White was one of the original shareholders of the North North Purchase. And we all know the North North Purchase has, was the original land you know, before it was called Easton and Mansfield and Norton was part of North. Um, so uh, that's all I can see come out for this house. And now I'm happy to uh, invite my, uh, my new friend, uh, Mark. Uh, so just a couple days ago, Mark calls me on the phone. Are you Joe? <laughs> yeah, that's Joe. Are you going to be the guy talking on Sunday? And he said, yeah. He says, well, I'm Mark. Uh, I got a couple of old photographs I'd like to share with you, if you don't mind. And I said, I, of course, I'd love to uh, share with you. So, uh, so I have Mark's photographs, and, and if, if Mark wants to come up and speak to them, I'll be keen to learn more about them. Well, I, I guess you could say I kind of blindsided Joe when I, uh, I gave him a call. I had just gotten the digital versions of these on Friday. So I gave him a call. He said, yeah, I'd love to put those in the, in the slide presentation. So this is... Uh, this is uh, I guess the newest structure that you'll see of the three photographs. This was a house that was built, I believe, in the late 1800s. It was my great grandfather. And you can see that, uh, and that house is still there, but you probably wouldn't recognize it now. The barn, which was a grand barn, if you look at that. I mean, it had a, it had a water pump, a window, and all that. Yeah, it was huge, according to what my, uh, my aunt's and uncle's. Old. And it it was uh, it was sold out of the family, I believe, in the 1940s. And since then, it's been owned by a number of different people. And uh, the barn was removed, supposedly to save on real estate tax. I mean, things were I guess things were rather tight back then. So that was part of that. Part of that. Do you have a street address for this, approximately? Well, uh, we have a street address. Uh, and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the street numbers, and my cousin Bob here may, may be aware of this, the street numbers on Bay Street and Taunton changed. And when I was doing some research, that threw me for a loop. Uh, about 1910, the numbers weren't as high as about, I think about 640, from the center of Taunton to the north line. Now, Today, the same house goes to 2368. So I think they must have realized that they had too many buildings and not enough numbers and decided to, to try to address that. So that's, a, that's my speculation, but I think I'm pretty close to being correct. So if this, we were to drive by there, what would say? Well, it's, it's the next to the last house on the left going north before you get to the north line. Okay, so right right after this house, and the next slide will show it will be my house. And then that, that's where I live. And the wagon isn't still out in front, by the way. <laughs> uh, 
And then right after that is a, is a street on the left, which is King Philip Road. And right there is the north. In fact, the north line goes diagonally through my backyard. Uh, and then the next question is, would you have to pay taxes to vote? <laughs> to vote? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then what's your street number? Mine is 2368. That was, I want to say that the time period of that photograph was probably 1900, 1910-ish. Um, I'm not sure if those are tele telegraph poles in the front or if they were, they had, you know, some other purpose. I mean, back then was when the electrification was just getting started. So uh, that, was a, that was a big, big industry. Yeah. So those poles are making a nice segue into this picture. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. And so this is a fairly new photograph that we discovered. This is a, uh, the previous, not, not my house, but the previous house with the Grand Bond. That fellow's name was Benjamin Lincoln. His brother, John Lincoln, who had a house almost like his across the street. And a little further down, that's the Snake River. You're, 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 looking on the, you're looking at the Taunton side of the Snake River. And that was a sawmill that they had, uh, I think the date on that was what, 1904? Yes, sir. Something, yeah. So that was a sawmill. And the bridge they were standing on was the old bridge. There was a, I don't know, people, a lot of, some of you may be aware, they, they reconfigured Bay Road, Bay Street, at the, at the Snake River. Uh, at the time of World War II, when they decided to put the army camp over there, the U.S. government quickly realized that the Old Bay Road, with the big curve uh, on the river, would not suffice to uh, allow for safe transport of you know the heavy army vehicles and so forth across. So that that uh, that new bridge was built, was put in and in, uh, I think, about 1943. Now, the question, one of the questions I have, Joe, is uh, when did the use of Bay Road as being the exclusive pathway shift to another road? Um, so, not to put you on the spot, you may not have had that question, Dan. No, well, you know, so you right, so Bay Road uh, didn't have a lot of curves as Mark mentioned, and it's because the original, the original road was by the, the Wampanoags, and they followed what was called the grain of the terrain. So they avoided swamps, and they avoided hills, so they would be more of a meandering road, which is what gives it some of its scenic appeal today. Um, but uh, as you get a little bit farther north, the, you know, you look at 138, and 138 parallels Bay Road pretty closely. So um, 138 was, was chartered by uh, by the Commonwealth to uh, you know, we want something a little bit more modern, a little bit more faster, a little bit straighter, uh, and uh, so so 138. And there was a lot of reluctance from a lot of the towns to put in this 138, um, but uh, obviously it, 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 it happened. But the eastern side of 138 went through a lot of swamp, um, and and so therefore it wasn't much of an attraction. Um, to, you know, um, if you follow uh, 106 and 138, and then you take 138 south down by the, the dog track, that area was all a lot of swampy area. And, and, and they, they told Easton, you know, we're going to build a road here. You have to help us. And they said, no, we'll give you the land for free. You build the road. <laughs> they, uh, they didn't want, you know, because it was too hard to do. Uh, but <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that was... Uh, but, you know, progress, you know, nothing's going to stand in the way of progress. So Bay Road sort of outlived its usefulness as a, uh, you know, as an old country road, and they wanted a, you know, a proper highway. Do you have any idea about when the transition era? I, I, I did. I, the Eastern guys were telling me that, and I, I think it was, I don't know, my best guess was sort of like the turn of the century around, you know, around the early 1900s. Oh, okay. Because the folk, family folklore that I have, is because my house is the closest one to the river. Before they put a bridge in, they had a ferry. And people coming and going would sometimes stay 
at, at my house and board, board their horse and have a libation or two. <laughs> but that seemed to be a convenient thing. That, you know, that, that there's no, no I, I don't know when that first bridge in Norton, you know, the Snake River was put in. So, you know, that's a, that's a mystery. So the last thing that I need to say is that, I don't know if Joe told you, that I hope you all took good notes. Because at the end of this, you're going to have a quiz. <laughs> uh, you only had you, you've had your first pop quiz. That's it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, um, who doesn't remember Benjamin's restaurant? I remember Benjamin. Of course. Okay. So I just, you know, we're talking about taverns and, and, and restaurants, and so uh, I remember going to Benjamin's restaurant, you know, many, many times, you know, with my wife and, and friends, and, uh, and you know, unfortunately, you know, it had quite a run. 68 to 2015, but all the times I've been there, I did not know that it was the site of a double tragedy. And are you guys aware of that? Mm -hmm. If it was, I would have probably gone a few more times and I would have like hung out and said, oh, this is what that happened. So I, I took some notes here just so I don't screw it up. Um, so George Poole, who was the owner of a silver company, um, and they were a rival to Reed and Barton. Um, and he fell boarding a streetcar at Wittenden Four Corners in 1905 and suffered a head injury and, and a subsequent change in his personality. And on the night of January 17, 1907, 15 months after the, uh, after the injury, George came home from work in a drunken rage after finding out that his wife, Minnie, fearing for her life, was considering having him committed to Dawn State Hospital. So George attacked his wife, Minnie, Howard, the middle son, um, then 17, ran upstairs, retrieved George's pistol uh, from a dresser drawer. George had never owned a gun before his head injury, and the acquisition of a weapon in his house was really quite alarming to his, to his family. Howard pressed the gun to the left side of his father's head and said he would shoot him if he didn't release his mother. He didn't. George shot. I mean, uh, Howard shot his dad. George was transported to Morton Hospital, where he died three hours later. Howard was taken into custody. Grand jury refused to indict him. It was considered, you know, self-defense for his mother, and he was released. So that's the, the wow. I remember going there in the library, beautiful, you know, all these books, you know, have another cocktail, and you know, wait for your prime rib. Um, and then Howard's brother, Arthur, would go on to serve as mayor of Taunton during the Great Depression. During his last year in office, Arthur's son, Arthur Poole Jr., committed suicide at the age of 14. It was Arthur's only child. Um, and, uh, and that was in 1939, you know, during the height of the Depression. Um, so, uh, you know, really quite a story of Benjamin's restaurant. It was owned by the Poole family for, for a number of years. And then, it's fell to the brick. Um, and, and now there's a, a bunch of, there's a subdivision, a bunch of houses that look like monopoly houses, you know, all one after the other, all you know, uniform and straight line, and, uh, and, and all that. Okay, um, I'm, I'm running a little longer than I wanted to, and I, I, I'm grateful for your indulgence. Um, so here's, uh, back up Bay Road now, we're gonna switch and look at some of the other things inside the taverns. But here's a school, it doesn't exist anymore, but, you know, use your imagination. So this is the intersection of, uh, of, of this is in Easton, um, and it's old, the old Bay Road School, and this is, uh, uh, Rockland Street. So Rockland Street, there's a Baptist church there, and here's the you know, Bay Road and Rockland, and here's the school. Now, you know, this is an archival photo from Easton, and it was across the street, and separate entrances for boys and girls. Because we no mingling here. <laughs> and here's the old Bay Road Chapel. Um, this is on the corner of Bay Road and Mountain, you know, at the Sharon Easton line. Um, and uh, they, uh, they think, well, you know, that's really middle of nowhere. There's nothing in and around Mountain Street. So uh, there was an association, and look at all of these names. Very very famous family names from this area. Tisdale, Smith, Morse, Platt, Billings. They all have streets and, you know, and, and buildings named after them. So, you know, uh, very famous names. Uh, the, the, uh, it, it stayed in, in place for a number of years. Regular services, attendance dropped off, the building deteriorated, the property reverted back to town, it was demolished. Uh, this is the closest thing to that corner now, um, and it's a, it's a residential home for, for young boys with special needs. So, 
Um, let's go a little bit you know, further south. Um, everybody must recognize this. The North Mountain Baptist Church is on the National Register. Across the street. Oh, we're going to shift gears. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, this is right near my house. This is at 1805, right near Dry Pond Cemetery. And it's hard to see, but this is the same marker. So, so if you're standing on Bay Road looking at this marker, you see a little S here. Then walk around to the other side, and now you're on the person's property looking out on the Bay Road, and you can see here's Bay Road out here, and here's another little S on the other side of the same marker. That's the Sharon Stoughton Town Line. You know, people, I tell, I tell this to people all the time. They go, no. And I go, well, come on. This is it. And it's right on this guy's property, 1805 Bay Road, in Sharon. So uh, it says, who mows your front lawn? Is it which town? <laughs> so some, now again, moving further south, this is just crossing from Sharon into East End, and you're on the right-hand side. This is Seven Bay Road, um, and it says uh, Taunton, 13 miles, Boston, 23 miles. This is kind of chipped off, 1773. And this was initially thought to be, and the Sharon people told me, um, that this was uh, uh, Richard Gridley. Richard Gridley um, was a surveyor, and Richard Gridley um, you know, surveyed a lot of the area around there, so they, he made this marker. Uh, my, my research contradicts that and says this is actually Joseph Gilbert, and if you can see, this is closer to a JG than an RG. So it's actually Joseph Gilbert, because Joseph Gilbert um, was on the Committee of Correspondence, was the precursor to the Sons of Liberty, which were part of the, you know, the, the radicals that got us our independence. And all of these model markers are attributed to the taverns in which they stood in front of. So I'm going to be paying for that marker. You're going to put my initials on it, not some surveyor who just said, you know, wherever it is. Um, so uh, that's, that's that model marker. And another one, um, originally at Five Corners, it's the Josiah Keith Tavern. Uh, so it was where, you know, we saw the mobile gas station. Now it's been moved up a little bit, and it's in half miles. Um, and now it's at Bay Road and Cross Street. And the name J.K., Josiah Keith, is chiseled off. Um, it's down here. It's chiseled off. So it says nine and a half miles to Taunton, and then uh, to Boston. No, to Taunton, and then 20, 26 and a half miles to Boston, 1773. Josiah Keith is chiseled off. Um, because he committed suicide in 1803, and you know, mental health was not considered, you know, uh, as, as, as we do consider it today, which is an illness. Um, it was like, you know, it was a bad thing to have. Then. And so, so he's buried in the, Josiah, in the Keith Family Cemetery, but he's buried north-south instead of east-west because he did a bad thing. Um, so this is uh, 4, 435 Bay Road. This is in Easton. Um, the 9 here is chipped away, but it's 9 miles to Taunton, um, and then 27 miles to Boston. And... Uh, the, this is Matthew Hayward, and this is a Matthew Hayward Tavern, which was across the street. And the Matthew Hayward Tavern um, uh, is, you know, MH is below the ground. Matthew Hayward um, had a slave, Anton, who marched with the militia, you know, up Bay Road uh, to the Lexington Alarm. And for his for his uh, uh, conspicuous service, he was crack in the street. Um, this is at the Benjamin Williams House, the second oldest house on Bay Road. It's right in their front yard. Um, my Eastern friends tell me that this is likely a replica marker, probably the first one that was destroyed by, by some sort of car that hit it. Um, and you can just barely make out it's eight miles to Taunton. Um, and then they're all marked 1773, which is interesting because, you know, similar to the, how people had to keep up the road, well, Easton was negligent in their responsibilities, and Bay Road was in disrepair. And so the Commonwealth fined the town of Easton that said, you will pay you know, 10 pounds for the poor condition of the road, and you keep paying 10 pounds until you fix it up. So that's why Easton has most of the mile markers, because they widened the road, they fixed it up, they put mile markers in there, and they got, they got the common oath off their back. Um, so it was surveyed, straightened, and improved, and so that's because they finally, you know, owned up to their responsibilities. Uh, today we're the beneficiaries of all these 1773 mile markers uh, that the Commonwealth forced upon. 
shift gears a little bit to the commemorative markers. This one's in Stoughton, uh, at the corner of Bayroy and Highland. And you can see an Indian trail, a thousand years, foot trail for early settlers, post riders, route, stagecoach, Taunton and Rhode Island from Boston, and the men men marched on this one. Along. So, uh, so they're saying Rhode Island, so they're kind of going with the Narragansett Bay on this one. And that seems to be the common, uh, the common prevailing opinion. Here's another one in Easton, um, an, an ancient Indian trail, post road between Massachusetts Bay and Narragansett Bay. See, they're laying their money down. <laughs> um, the old Bay Road Historic District, one of us, this is in Easton, so commemorative markers. It just sounds romantic, you know, when you go into two states, you know, as opposed to, uh, but we know better now. All right, a couple things about some cemeteries. This is Dry Pond Cemetery. This is uh, by that bay and plain in Stoughton. And an interesting guy, Lemuel Smith, um, he was a, uh, um, a resident of the town of Stoughton. He was a soldier of the Revolution. My story on, on Lemuel Smith was uh, he enlisted at age 16, participated in the campaigns in Rhode Island and New York. They were nine months each. He helped with the fortifications of Dorchester Heights. He saw the British withdraw from Boston Harbor. He was captured in the White Plains, New York. Spent a year as a POW. He and a comrade overpowered a guard and escaped. He walked home to Bay Road with the clothes on his back to resume a life of agriculture and self-sustenance. <laughs> and there he is, still on Bay Road. <laughs> This is, you know, again, you drive by these things all the time. So I pulled off, um, and, and, uh, and you know, this says the Old Bay Road Cemetery, 1772. So this says, this hallowed ground, in this hallowed ground lie 150 bodies of veterans of various wars, French and Indian, Revolution, War of Eagle, Civil War, and Mexican Wars. Exactly where the bodies buried is unknown. So what's the story here? So the story here is interesting that, um, that a, uh, there's a couple of cemeteries inside the cemetery. So this is just a marker. So we're seeing, you know, this marker is down here. And they just have some random flags placed there. So this was a pauper's cemetery as well. So if you couldn't afford a burial, they would just you know, put you in a you know, pauper cemetery to get buried here. And some of the veterans got buried and they had some headstones. So they had this guy that was, uh, that was sort of the town drunk, you know, not to sound disparaging, but um, he was locked up you know, and spent you know, a couple of weeks in jail and they, you know, he had to work off his debt. So they said, listen, we need you to go cut the grass at the cemetery. And so he's coming off a bender and he's going to cut the grass at the cemetery and he says, it'd be a lot easier if I just take these headstones away. <laughs> so he cuts the grass. And, and then he can't remember where all the headstones go, so the headstones never end up just. And so, so, so Easton is considering some sort of ground penetrating radar, somebody that wants to get some doctoral program and, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and be a hero. Uh, but that's uh, why the graves are unknown. Just real quick, go through some cemeteries. So this is at Easton. Easton probably has more cemeteries per capita than almost any town of its size in New England, or even larger. And because they're all little families. So here's the Jedediah Willis graveyard, 1820. Um, this is the Keith graveyard, 18, 14, 1812. And this is where um, the Josiah Keith descendant that committed suicide is buried uh, at a riot angle. Um, this is the Elijah Copeland. This is just one family. This is right across from Beaverbrook Road. So you literally see Beaverbrook Road, look to the right, it's on somebody's private property. So, you know, from the street, this is all you see, you know, these, there's only a couple of headstones here, one, two, maybe three, and these are all just posts marking the cemetery. That's the cemetery right there, and that's it. Okay, uh, Bay Street in Taunton, here's another one, the North Taunton Cemetery, we all have driven by this a hundred times, it's right, you know, at the uh, 495 overpass. Uh, you know, again, you could spend a whole talk just on, you know, the famous people that are buried within these cemeteries. All right, pop quiz, name that body of water. Lake Winnipeg. Good job, all right. Give that guy a star. All right, and here's uh, another one. So I'm going to end with a couple of their here and nows, you know, then and nows, I mean, so then and nows. So here's Bay Street in Taunton in 1910. So you're, you're um, at Whittington Four Corners looking down into Taunton Green. 
Okay. So, so your uh, uh, Whittington Four Corners is behind you, and your and your you know, if you follow this road around the corner, you'd end end up into Taunton Green. So, I call your attention to a couple of things. That's a bell sign. This is 1910. Big deal. They got a phone inside. You know, you could use the phone inside. Uh, and you look at the outline of these buildings, and you look at the cornices up here, and, and some of these things. Look at this. Okay, fast forward 110 years. Uh, same building, same overlooks. You can see the outline of the old buildings. These, all this is exactly the same. So you look here, you look here. Not changed very much at all. Yes, sir. No, if, you, if you put yourself in the place where that photographer was, and turn to your left, this is the fire station. Yeah. Which was there in 1910. Yeah, and, and, and this is this you know, the orange. This is the Bullish Eagle Club, and this is Britannia Street. Yes, yeah. and down there, and that's where the Reed and Barton used to be. And, yes, you know, uh, there was an Army Reserve Center that was down there, and that's where I spent uh, many a years. You know, where I spent like a what do they call it? I spent a, a year there one month. <laughs> <laughs> it's more phones now, though. <laughs> just doing about face. So this is looking into the same thing. So now instead of looking down, we're gonna oh, about face, we're gonna look up. We're gonna look up towards north. So uh, so here's 1910, Whittenden, and so now you're looking up the street towards north in, in this direction and the road curves a little bit this way. So again look at the you know the sort of hardware stores and you know the people again 1910 and then fast forward to 2020. So again, you can see, you can still see some of the cornices and some of the sides. This is Whitman House of Pizza. You may have had a couple of pies in there. Go back. So they, you know, they really, you know, what's, you know, this building is largely unchanged. These buildings are largely unchanged. This is a little bit changed. But, you know, just, you know, then and now. Kind of interesting. I'd like to just thank you know, a lot of the people that helped me put this together, and, uh, and if, you know, if you see Denise, uh, give her a, a thanks for me. Um, so I did reach out to every uh, historical... Oh, Denise. Every, every, she might have, Denise is my neighbor's daughter. Well, say hi for me. <laughs> so I, I reached out to everybody that I could, uh, including the Mashpee Wampanoags um, and the uh, Massachusetts... Uh, I, I actually tried to get the Massachusetts tribe as well. There's the probably me show. The State Archives, uh, the Mass Archaeological Society, um, and they were very helpful. And again, I really only scratched the surface. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll leave you with this quote from Benjamin Franklin. Historians relate not so much what is done as what they would have believed. <laughs> because we have to fill in the blanks with some of our imaginations. So uh, thanks and enjoy Bay Road with a new perspective. Oh, okay.